In our series, The World After Coronavirus, our guest today is Mark Blythe. Mark is at Brown University at the Watson Institute, and we want to ask him what he thinks the future of growth might look like in a post-COVID world. The future of growth, an interesting question. Let's hope we have some. One of the curious things about the world before Corona was that growth rates, particularly amongst the so-called developed economies, were in secular decline. So much so that we had this disconnect where stock markets were booming everywhere, yet wages were stagnant. And the general feeling of prosperity for many populations was, was shrinking. And we saw this with the populist reaction and all the rest of it. So let's try and think systematically about this. How exactly do countries or economies, however they're scaled up, tickle the underlying components of GVA, gross value added, to get GDP? And if you do what's called GDP decomposition exercises, you can figure this out. And it conforms with common sense. So, for example, the Germans rely on exports. There's a big no shit Sherlock award, right? China is not nearly as export dependent today as it was 10 years ago, but it's still a very large exporter. The United States is still a quarter of the global economy and does a little bit of everything and is primarily driven by consumption. The American growth model basically relies for shock absorbers on the ability to protect the financial sector so you can keep liquidity going and allow bankruptcies on the one hand and unemployment on the other. There's no shock absorbers for this. It relies on exogenous shocks to the economy that are sharp and short, and then you get this kind of V out of it. When you're hit with something like corona, which is simultaneously a demand and supply shock, and it continues in waves, this type of growth model that's based on consumption is a disaster. The analogy I like to use for this is Europe's a bit like a Volvo. It's got airbags everywhere. It's really comfortable. If you have to sleep in it for six months, you can, and if you crash in it, you'll probably live. The United States is basically a six-liter Mustang GT that's belting down the highway and it's fabulous so long as it's going in that one direction. But if you try and stop it suddenly, everything flies off. So what's a post-corona world going to look like? Well, for the United States, it's very unclear how it keeps this Mustang-like economy going. If it has to do lockdowns, if it has to do partial openings, if it has to do restarts over the next few months, the system really is not geared for this. But if you open up the economy and try and restart it all at once, you destroy your health system, which is 20% of US GDP. So the United States has a particularly thorny set of problems to deal with going forward. Europe, on the other hand, has got its own problems in terms of the EU and the dominance of the ECB if you're in the Eurozone. What is surprising is how much they've just done straightforward consumption maintenance. They get the fact that they depend on wages producing demand. And if you don't support wages, their growth model fails. What does this mean going forward? I think it means that the United States is going to have to retool. Where it's going to retool its shock absorbers is probably going to be particularly in its healthcare system. What are the Europeans going to do? It's going to teach them not to be afraid of deficits. So Europe is a Volvo, and you said the US is a Mustang. What is China? And what do you think developing countries might be? Uh, maybe a rickshaw? drawn by humans. I'm going to do two big abstractions here. So the Chinese model is increasingly like the United States in the sense that it's internal consumption that matters, but it still has a very large export component. It also has a very large state-owned enterprise sector, which the government controls and can be used to absorb unemployment and direct spending. That type of command and control system is a very different set of shock absorbers. It's not about finance and maintaining consumption. It's essentially non-market mechanisms for control. Shift it to another perspective, all of Latin America is deeply, deeply in trouble. Not only are their bond markets collapsing, Argentina's on the brink of default, not only do they have leaders that deny the virus like Mexico and also in Brazil, essentially the entire regional economy is dependent on the export of commodities. And that export is completely shut down and commodity prices in some cases are in free fall as we see with oil. The rich economies with large welfare states have a particular set of Volvo-like absorbers it costs a lot of money to run these things like it does to run a Volvo. I know I've got one, right? Uh, the United States is the Mustang. This may not be the moment for the Mustang. China has its own way of dealing with things and it can certainly absorb shocks. Well, how robust it is, we'll find out. But the developing world, quote unquote, particularly Latin America, they're the ones that are going to be the hardest hit by this economically. What does it mean for that global highway? When, when all of these economies come together, there was a way in which all of these, the Volvo and the Mustang and the rickshaw, fitted together. 
how might it fit together in the future or not? That is the proverbial $64,000 question. And the truth is we don't know. If we consider some of the things that we've discovered, that not just the United States, although it's this, the extreme case, that 90% uh, of all of the masks used by healthcare workers are not made in the United States. That 80% of all the protective personal equipment that they need is not made in the United States. There, is, there are strategic reasons beyond military reasons for onshoring production and deglobalizing. Do we see an end to globalization? No, but we will see basically a version 2.0, which will have a much more strategic character, whereby governments, I suspect, will want to know what, is, what have we got at home and what can we make at home and what do we need to make at home.